Great. All right. Well, let me go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about the agenda and the presenters. So uh, with us, we have uh, Fidel from the University of Oxford. He will be going first, uh, really kicking off and talking about some end-to-end -end workflow solutions uh, that involve free server and FSL. That'll be fantastic. Followed by Andre from DNA Nexus. He'll be talking about... Uh, Andre will be talking about a whole bunch of new uh, things that the UKB research analysis platform has to offer you for uh, image analysis as well as uh, generating image-derived phenotypes. Uh, after that, he's going to hand the baton to Rob Holtz and Renee uh, from MathWorks, and uh, really they're going to present how you can take a very, very powerful software tool that's kind of a household name, bring it on to the research analysis platform uh, and use it for image analysis. Uh, they have a new uh, image analysis toolbox. And then following that, uh, Asha Collins from DNA Nexus is going to give uh, a few thoughts about really uh, efficient cloud computing. And uh, so that I think will be fantastic. That's something a lot of people ask about, particularly in the imaging space and particularly as we're sort of uh, moving into doing a lot of machine learning uh in uh the imaging space which andre and uh i'm sure rob and renee uh will allude to but with we probably won't have a deep dive in this symposium stay tuned early next year uh we'll probably have a whole webinar on that a couple public service announcements i want to make uh before we uh get into that uh there will be uh also a multimodal data integration uh round table coming in uh, January or February. It's something I'm very excited about, something that I think uh, so many folks in our space are, are excited about. I mean, we're really all here to, to cluster data, um, cluster individuals uh, so that they can be treated in coherent ways. And I think multimodal data uh, is so crucial to that. Um, and then we'll also have uh, in the spring or late winter, early spring, we'll also have a EWAS webinar um, and check out community announcements about those things. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and here's an advertisement for the community. Uh, you can probably uh, screenshot this uh, QR code uh, or drag the link off. I'm sure somebody else can also put it in the uh, uh, Q&A. Um, and uh, you'll get access to a bunch of stuff, including recorded webinars. So that's awesome. Uh, if you are an early career researcher or uh, 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 from a low or middle income country, you are able to get uh, either reduced access fees and or uh, credits uh, for uh, cloud compute on uh, the research analysis platform. Thanks to AWS for that. And uh, check out this QR code to apply um, or uh, visit the website. All of these links are also on the community as well as around on the web. So uh, that that should be available to, to some of you uh, and uh, good luck with that. Um, so yeah, we, I keep referring to the research analysis platform. So uh, really, this is a space on DNA Nexus uh, powered by our Apollo product uh, that hosts all the phenotype, um, bulk uh, genome data, as well as bulk imaging data, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and, and like I mentioned, you know, really sort of the massive use case in biomedical science is being able to coherently cluster uh, individuals such uh, that they can be treated. Uh, very specifically for disease. And I feel personally that imaging analysis is such a huge part of that, uh, really understanding how to treat patients as well as giving us insights uh, into uh, really the basic biology of uh, human health and disease. And so I'm really excited uh, about this particular technology, these particular things uh, that we're doing. And I think Really, what we're going to have today is an amazing, really pragmatic session where we walk you through uh, a whole bunch of uh, new tools and resources that we have uh, for the imaging component of, uh, of this analysis.
that said, I'm very excited uh, to transition uh, to uh, my colleague Fidel from the University of Oxford. Uh, please follow him on Twitter. Um, and uh, he's going to talk uh, a lot about, uh, like I said, end-to-end -end workflows uh, on the UKB rep. So uh, without further ado, here's Fidel. Um, hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So as Ben said, I'm Fidel from the University of Oxford. I'm going to talk about, the, about advanced imaging in the UKB RIP. So I will start giving a brief background about the brain imaging in UK Biobank. As most of you know, UK Biobank is a prospective epidemiological study aimed to gather information of half a million UK residents aged uh, 45 to 75 years old. And that kind of information that uh, it's being gathered, it's the genetic data, biological samples, lifestyle information and health records of the uh, participants. And the goal of the project is to discover early markers and risk factors of disease. Uh, there uh, was um, an, a, an intention to uh, perform, to scan the, the brain and the body of 100,000 subjects, and 60,000 of them will have a second time point scan. Uh, so far, in the brain imaging part of the project, we have released the data of, well, at the end of this year, we will be releasing the data of more than 50,000 subjects, uh, which include uh, the COVID-19 sub-study. And the kind of information that we are releasing is the, the raw unprocessed images of six emoji modalities, plus an additional one uh, that will only be available for another small subset of, sub of subjects. Uh, and we will also release, we are also releasing more than 4,000 IDPs, imagine the right phenotypes, which are variables that are uh, aimed to be easily usable by non imaging expert. And we also have uh, released uh, some templates of the different modalities from the original, from the first 4,500 subjects. Uh, uh, so I will now describe the, the different imaging modalities. In the structural part, we have the T1 weighted images, T2 flare, and susceptibility weighted images. Um, and in the functional part, we have resting fMRI, which are images that are acquiring while the participants are not doing any, any specific task, and task fMRI, which is the opposite. They are doing a specific task. Uh, in the diffusion part of the of the study, we have the good quality images that allow us to see the uh, structural uh, features of the white matter. And the whole acquisition takes uh, around 35 minutes per subject. This, um, this protocol has been highly optimized because uh, adding just one minute to this protocol would cost uh, millions of pounds. Uh, so what are we doing with the data? Starting with the raw DICOMs, uh, these images go through a process, an automatic processing pipeline based on FSL. And what we get out of that is a set of, as I said before, raw and processed NIFTY images and what we call imaging derived phenotypes, which are just uh, numeric variables that reflect uh, some feature of the brain. This is one example of one of these IDPs. Uh, which it would be the volume of the left thalamus, and there are thousands of these IDPs in the in the biobank showcase. What can we do with this uh, variable? Well, uh, one example would be finding correlations between imaging variables and non-imaging variables. In this case, we are showing a clear relationship between the volume of white matter hyperintensities, which are basically lesions in the white matter. Some feedback. Yeah, uh, and AIDS. And, and this, the volume of the white matter hyperintensities was calculated with Bianca, which is one of the tools in FSL. Uh, but this is just one of the many associations that we can find in the UK Biobank. In the last uh, abstract that we published, we show we showed the uh, with 
saw this Manhattan plot with 62 million pairwise correlations uh, between all IDPs and non-IDPs. And as we are showing here, 80,000 of them are von Ferroni significant. Now I'm going to briefly speak about the pipeline, the processing pipeline and the Docker image that we get out of it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the processing pipeline is a fully automated compu computing structure. As you are seeing in this figure, the basic blocks of this computing structure are neuroimaging tools, mostly in our case FSL. And these tools process the images and generate new images or values that will be used in the next steps in the pipeline. So FSL is the software library that is developed in the University of Oxford, and it's mainly for image, uh, brain image analysis and statistics. Uh, but and the whole structure of the pipeline, the pipeline is uh, written in Bash and Python. As I said, most of the basic blocks are FSL, but there are some that are not, uh, that maybe mm, scripts written in other languages, MATLAB or R, and some other tools that belong to other so, uh, brain imaging software libraries, like FreeSurfer, SPM, or ANTS. Uh, the pipeline is divided in different sections according to CPU and GPU needs. In this link, you can access the, the code of the pipeline, which was freely distributed. And we also created a Docker image with all the packages needed to run the pipeline. And in this link, you can access the, the Docker file, the recipe to build that Docker image. And the Docker will, will be 55 gigabytes and has been already uploaded to the RAP, although right now it's not publicly available until we fully test it. Uh, the image is so big, the Docker image, because it, uh, apart from the Linux distribution and a full working Python distribution, there's also FSL, five different MATLAB MCRs that we are keeping for historic reasons, and two versions of ReSurfers. And, and there are also their neuroimaging packages that we use in the processing. Um, and yeah, that link is, as I said before, the the Docker file, the recipe for to build this Docker image. Um, well, the pipeline has uh, big data needs. For example, uh, it generates six gigabytes of data per subject, and that in total will be one petabyte. The whole processing of one subject takes 21 CPU hours and one GPU hour. Uh, but although those some of these tasks, tasks can run in parallel, so it can be reduced to 12 hours. And with no GPUs, uh, the processing would take almost two days. Another challenge, a big data challenge, that uh, is the consequence of the size of this project is that the modeling, the finding associations between IDPs and other kind of variables uh, can be difficult because the matrices are really big. So that needs some thinking. And finally, um, other imaging researchers can run their own pipe analysis in the RAP. Um, and now I, I'm going to show how we are uh, using the Docker image in the RAP. It's very simple. So first we create a Docker image with the Docker, Docker file that I showed before. And we upload that image to the RAP storage using the DX interface. And the next step is to upload to that storage uh, some scripts and the list of subjects to process. And then uh, create a, a workstation instance and SSH into it to run the, the scripts that we just uploaded. This, in this link, you can find the, the code to, that does all everything that I'm describing in more detail. Uh, using all, all the time the DX interface, we first upload the list of subjects or data sets to process. Um, then we upload the scripts to do the processing. Those scripts are also in this uh, GitLab. Um, after that, we start a, a CPU machine uh, using the run cloud workstation command of the, DX. 
And finally, we indicate with an SSH command to start the script that we just uploaded. Uh, this is the code to do everything that I'm just describing. Uh, it's very simple. Um, and as I said, it's available in that GitLab link. Uh, after that comes the, the, the main processing part of the, of the pipeline, which is um, downloading the Docker image that we uploaded before, uh, downloading the data set to the machine that we, are, we want to run those subjects in, run the Docker image with those data sets and return the results to the storage in more detail. Uh, yeah, the first step is just downloading the Docker image. As, as it's a big Docker image, this will take a bit of time. Then loading in memory the, the Docker image, the container. Downloading the data of the subjects that we want to process and unzip them. And finally, uh, use the Docker image to process, to process uh, run the pipeline and process this, the data of the subjects zip the results and unload the results to the storage. Uh, uh, what I described was were the steps for the first uh, CPU block of the pipeline. Uh, and then uh, step four is doing that with the GPU block. And it's exactly the same. First, we upload the scripts and upload the list of subjects to process, which would be the same as the, as the previous step and then generate a new cloud workstation, in this case, a GPU cloud workstation, and uh, start the processing. And then again, the process is the same, but in this case, for, for GPU processing, uh, download the Docker image, uh, load it in memory, run the, the pipeline, indicating that it has to run the second block of the pipeline, uh, and then see the results and re return them to the storage. And that's 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 the whole oh, that's the whole processing. This is the code to do that, and it's available in the in the GitLab link, and it's very easy to do. And that's all. Thank you. Wow! Thank you, Fidel. I personally thought I was able to give a lot of very dense information in thirteen minutes, but I see now the gauntlet has been thrown down and. Uh, I have something to aspire to. That was absolutely fantastic and, and extremely dense and, and amazing. And I, I hope uh, I can, uh, we can convince lots of people to watch that uh, in the future and, and uh, if you're here. Uh, we'll give just a minute or two, uh, a few seconds for people to type in burning questions into the Q&A. Uh, but if there are not burning questions, uh, we will transition uh, to the next speaker. Um, um, uh, very excited uh, for people to be able to try this out, and we'll uh, we'll we'll also get those Docker links onto community.dnanexus.com. So that this is quite fantastic, really. Thank you very much for working on this project and also presenting it here. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, this is actually a fairly common question in our uh, in our uh, imaging webinar series. Uh, somebody is asking uh, if the, these libraries can be used for uh, OCT analysis. What, what libraries? FSL? Uh, yes. That's, I think uh, that's the, uh, yeah. I don't think it, it can. It's just meant to be used for brain imaging analysis. Well, if in the interaction with the, the brain activation, yeah, it can be used for that, but not for retina imaging. Not that I know of. Anyway. Yeah, um, we a lot of people ask us about uh, uh, retinal imaging, and so uh, we will probably offer uh, a separate webinar on that. Although I will say uh, the MathWorks people may have some things to say about retinal imaging. We've had some discussions with them. Maybe we can uh, turn that over to sort of a panel discussion at the end uh, and think about how to move forward with that, uh, whether that be a webinar or something else. Uh, any other questions for Fidel right now? And uh, again, we'll we'll try to bring him back for a, a bit of a panel discussion at the end. Uh, to the next question, uh, yeah, we'll uh, actually. I think we can get to that question uh, at the end, and that that'll be a great segue off of. Uh, there's a question: uh, How much the, does the analysis cost to run? Um, and actually, that's calculable just from the numbers that. Uh, 
uh, Fidel put up in one of his slides uh, based on UKB rates. But uh, I think that that also segues really well from uh, the talk that Ash is going to give. So uh, why don't we uh, hold that question to the end and then we can talk about that as, as sort of a more holistic discussion. It'll be interesting to bring GPUs into that as well. Um, so with that, uh, what I think I'd like to do is transition over to uh, Andre from DNA Nexus, uh, who's going to talk about a whole bunch of uh, new tools and features uh, on the wrap, uh, really, for image analysis. So without further ado, here's Andre. Perfect, Ben. Thank you for your uh, nice uh, introducing me. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, in the next uh, session, in the next part, I would like to talk about advanced image analysis on the UKB wrap. Um, some of you, you may remember uh, my name from the very first uh, imaging uh, webinar we had in April. Uh, but officially, uh, I'm Andre, uh, and uh, I work at DNA Nexus as community engagement scientist. Uh, so I mostly focus on um, UKB data, uh, maybe here more specifically uh, into uh, imaging data. What is our agenda for today? I would like to cover um, a bit of uh, intro to image analysis. We covered a lot uh, in April, uh, but still, I would like to keep some material here. Uh, then I would like to talk about uh, new software updates uh, and uh, about uh, three popular neuroimaging tools. Uh, we also uh, heard a lot um, about it uh, from uh, Fidel, but uh, this will be NiPipe, FSL, and FreeSurfer here specifically on the research analysis platform. Uh, then I would like to uh, talk about uh, tips and tricks for visualization on the platform. Uh, and, and at the end of uh, this part, I would like to provide, I would like to present a demo. Uh, we will be looking uh, at a notebook, uh, which will be presenting uh, how to work with NiPipe on the wrap. Great. So here in this uh, section, in this presentation, I would like to present new cool features and uh, new cool functionalities uh, for image analysis on the wrap. Uh, but actually here, for those who um, had no chance to uh, re watch uh, recording or attend the, the webinar we had in April, I am providing here a link to this one uh, because uh, some of the material, some of the content here is building actually on what we said and what is the ter ter terminology uh, presented in April. Uh, what is also great, actually, Fidel uh, covered a lot of material about FSL, about FreeSurfer and the pipelines and actually how the data, yeah, I mean imaging data, on the rep uh, are generated, so that is also great. We have uh, we have right now uh, this background. Uh, this is perfect. But th again, this is the link to our previous web webinar we are building uh, on. Great. So uh, one of the main pillars uh, of what we were talking in April. Uh, was that we were mentioning and we were trying to provide examples uh, on how to run uh, popular neuroimaging tools such as FSL, FreeSurfer on RAP, uh, but mostly we were trying to implement it via Docker solution. Uh, the main purpose or our main aim was actually to introduce these tools in order to compute more derived phenotypes or compute derived phenotypes. So just to start with some recap uh, or to do some intro to that, what is actually uh, image derived phenotype in general and what is actually image derived phenotype on the research analysis platform? This is very simple actually, it's just a number. This is just a number which represents uh, situation. So on the right side of this screen, let's consider brain anatomy and uh, image derived phenotype typically is kind of uh, number uh, which is representing, let's say, volume or some segmented parcelated part of the particular uh, brain area or structure. Uh, which is actually converted uh, to some number value, to some, to some, to some value. So we can talk actually about um, hippocampus, and we can collect 
all these areas, all these numbers. We can extract all these uh, numbers from all participants of our interest, I would say, uh, and collect it into Biobank. Uh, this could be uh, represented uh, or visualized by histogram or saved uh, into some representation, which is then um, in the UKB data or on the wrap uh, represented or by or defined by data field. Uh, you can then access these volumes, these numbers, these image derived phenotypes on the platform in many ways. And we will be talking about that. Typically, what then we can do with these image derived phenotypes, these are typically input for some subsequent or advanced analysis, uh, typically for some statistical analysis or machine learning applications, let's say more specifically in the um, world of uh, life science, it would be it could be GIVAS or FIVAS studies. So just again, very simply, these are scalar values derived from raw imaging data. We have some available, but we can always compute more. And that's the reason why we are trying to introduce new uh, pipelines, new tools, um, and new ways how to work with that. Um, all right, so one already mentioned tool, uh, well-known and popular and a very powerful tool for not just for extracting, not just for computing image-derived phenotypes, but just for many other image manipulations is FSL, developed by Oxford Group. Uh, we were running it last time via Docker image, but let's just to uh, do some recap of what, it, what FSL is. FSL is comprehensive li library of analysis tools. So it's consisting of, uh, of many features. And as I said, it's, it, it's mostly uh, to uh, compute image derived phenotypes. Uh, where you can access these image derived phenotypes actually computed by FSL, by the pipeline, uh, or parts of pipeline Fidel was talking about, you can find it in a cohort browser, UKB wrap cohort browser, or you can access it via DNA Nexus database. It's a database object in your uh, project on the platform. Uh, and one a typical operation for working with uh, uh, images and F, uh, in FSL is BET command, uh, which uh, which does uh, school stripping, or in uh, other words, it's uh, brain extraction. So I would like to show you uh, some examples uh, how to do that. Uh, of course, there are other examples or useful commands. Um, for example, using FSL, you can do segmentation, you can do registration, or you can do many other mathematical manipulations of the images. So let's consider the following situation. Um, uh, in this um, fi figure or, or, or plot, uh, you can see brain with, um, in three orientations. Um, and let's consider this is the raw image or some image as input for the FSL. So we can apply uh, skull stripping, I mean this uh, BET command. And after that, this will generate, so as input, we have some volume data, typically in nifty format, and as output, we will get uh, another nifty format, but the result now, uh, it's after skull stripping. So that's that's one uh, that's one really simple, typically pre-processing step done via FSL. Right, and now maybe more in programmatical way, more technical things how to actually run it on the platform. And last time we saw uh, the following situation. We were trying to reuse or load publicly available Docker image uh, and apply uh, this skull stripping operation uh, via DNA Nexus tool, which is called Swiss Army Knife. Uh, this was relatively quick. Uh, we commented on the configuration uh, and it worked. But this time I would like to tell you more about new software updates uh, and uh, what you can do possibly uh, right now on the platform. So yeah, perfect. So let's uh, let's continue with actually the new software updates, uh, which are uh, NiPipe, FSL, and FreeSurfer on RAP. We just had a chance to um, hear something about FSL. Uh, FreeSurfer is... Uh, also tool uh, mostly used for computing image derived phenotypes. Uh, and uh, these uh, two tools typically uh, can be combined into a workflow. And uh, for this uh, reason, uh, we are introducing NiPy.
So where you can find these uh, new software updates and new tools, uh, maybe some of you, uh, you have uh, some experience, some practical experience with JupyterLab. Uh, and uh, now um, we have two new flavors, uh, JupyterLab flavors. Uh, and two new images, uh, so now you can use you can use this and find this functionality under image processing flavor. Uh, you can find it when when you are spinning spinning up a new machine, new new Jupyter Lab session. You will find it under uh, or as a new feature, as as it's shown on the right side of this uh, screen. So basically, what you can do, you can play around um, or play with all the functionality. Um, as uh, what uh, Fidel was uh, was describing and, and explaining. Perfect. So just uh, along with this uh, software update and just to support uh, su support you in your an analysis, uh, we also published uh, we developed notebooks and we also published uh, that uh, as publicly available material. You can find it in our DNA Nexus uh, slash Open Bio repository. You can find there two notebooks. Uh, first of uh, them is showing image processing in FSL uh, plus NiPy, uh, and then image processing um, using FreeSurfer, uh, and also visualizations are part of uh, these uh, notebooks. Uh, this is all done on uh, some publicly available data. So. I'll be showing uh, some demo uh, later um, in this presentation. So mm, that's the new update on no notebooks. We recommend to try that. Uh, we recommend uh, to run it on UKB data, on, on real UKB data on your site. Yes. So here you can find link uh, to that. Uh, all right, so let's maybe jump to visualization part of this presentation. And here I would like to talk about a couple of uh, tips uh, and tricks and uh, extend uh, what we discussed uh, in uh, April. So let's uh, just uh, do some quick uh, recap uh, what we talked about uh, last time. Uh, last time we were mostly focusing on two main ways, how to visualize data in general and then on UKB RAP platform. Uh, we covered, we talked about non-interactive ways, how to visualize data. Uh, mostly we were showing some examples um, in a Jupyter Lab. Uh, we were commenting on libraries uh, such as PyDicom, NiBabel, or, or, or NiLearn, and how to apply it to uh, volume data. Uh, and uh, then we were uh, uh, mentioning interactive ways how to work. Uh, yes, so we can review it here, uh, or you can uh, watch the recording to get more in, in information about that. So this time, uh, interestingly, uh, I would like to uh, talk about how to visualize data actually directly, not just like uh, by running DNA Nexus job, but how you can visualize data directly in your DNA Nexus project. No need to run JupyterLab, no need to run TTYB, uh, basically no need to run uh, DNA Nexus job. All right, we have several different methods to view data on the app. I would like to concentrate on uh, two main uh, options. Uh, first of them is to basically preview and open uh, some kind of file types directly in your project. Um, this is not only about imaging, but you have um, possibility to visualize many file formats. Typically, it could be TXT, uh, but not just plain TXT, but also any other text-based file format in bioinformatics. It could be FASTA file, more specifically in neuroimaging or imaging, or let's say neuroimaging. It could be a result of FreeSurfer. Uh, then you can look at um, uh, pictures like uh, PNG or PDF, or um, uh, also you can open HTML file. Uh, how you can do that, uh, you will see example, uh, but, but when you click on uh, the object in your project, and uh, this belongs to one of these uh, uh, options, uh, you will find preview tab, preview button, uh, so you can click on it and, and, and the file will open. Um, then, second option, uh, more programmatic way, uh, you can use uh, something which is called file viewer. 
uh, I am uh, linking here um, in the presentation to documentation page. Uh, if you are interested into this, you can read more about it and uh, you can try to create your own file viewer. Uh, and what you can actually do, you can, like using file viewer, you can uh, visualize data uh, and use some existing web-based tools, uh, which is already available on the UK BRAP. I will provide some examples, or you can, as I mentioned, create new one, your, your custom one. So what is available on the wrap? This is not um, this is not imaging or neuroinformatics. Uh, it's uh, integrated genome viewer, uh, JavaScript based. But uh, you can learn a lot from the code. You can learn a lot how to may maybe convert this into more specific neuroimaging uh, viewer. Uh, then there is Jupyter Notebook viewer, and uh, also for Previewing your gzip files, there is a gzip uh, file viewer. Yes, and then of course you can create a new one uh, or custom custom viewer. I am adding link to documentation page here. All right, so how to actually run it? Uh, this is very simple. This is very simple and straightforward. Uh, in your project, you will find a tab which is called visualize. And under this tab, you will find DNA Nexus viewers. Uh, there are three right now. Uh, it's that uh, that's the IGV.js, that's the Jupyter uh, Notebook Previewer, uh, Previewer, which is a really useful feature, um, and uh, then GZIP File pre uh, pre Previewer. Uh, but uh, you can always uh, create a new one. Perfect. So how you can actually create new one? Uh, you can create new one uh, if you are comfortable with HTML and uh, JavaScript. So it's more like developer uh, work. Uh, and uh, if you know this technology, HTML, mostly HTML and JavaScript, you can create custom, uh, custom viewers. Uh, of course, you can inspire uh, from the already existing viewers, uh, download these viewers, uh, study the code, um, and uh, rewrite it uh, according to your needs. Uh, what would be our tip, uh, maybe for imaging and for image file handling on the platform, um, you can try to look at Nifty Viewer, or you can try to create a zip folder preview, because many of the file formats are zipped. Uh, so uh, that could be a good feature for, uh, let's say, rapid QC of uh, raw files. So uh, again, I'm uh, adding here a link to documentation page on how to create a custom viewer. Perfect. Uh, another topic um, which 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 uh, which belongs uh, to these uh, which belongs to these uh, visualization options and trips and ticks uh, and tricks. I would like to talk about uh, repeated IDPs uh, and how to visualize trajectories. Uh, actually. Uh, repeated IDPs is uh, something uh, what is connected to longitudinal analysis because typically for each IDP, image-derived phenotypes, uh, there, is, uh, there's, there is something which is called imaging visits. So you can access uh, this field ID or this IDP for multiple instances, uh, typically measured or typically uh, obtained uh, during the time. So what you can typically do uh, here in as, as, as my recommendation or as my tip, I would use, I would run Jupyter Lab and I would use Python library Seaborn to create uh, some large number of uh, uh, facets and histograms and combine imaging visits, IDPs, uh, multiple um, other phenotypes and so on into the nicely looking plots. So, so that uh, that would be my tip for visualizing repeated uh, image derived phenotypes. All right, so now it's time for NiPipe demo. Uh, I uh, I am going to log into the platform and uh, share my screen. I am now sharing my. Uh, DNA Nexus project, uh, testing DNA Nexus uh, project on the regular DNA Nexus uh, platform. Uh, I followed uh, the uh, instructions or individual cells 
in one of the uh, notebooks in the public repository. And I, I tried to reproduce what was done in the image processing uh, FSL notebook in the open bio repository. So what we can do now, I will try to open it, uh, not via DNNX's job, but via Visualize Tab and Jupyter Notebook pre Previewer and uh, tell you more about um, uh, important parts of the FSL and of the NiPy. Yeah. So here, what I can do, I can do either uh, pre I can click on the preview uh, and uh, open open the uh, open the IPython notebook here. But what what I will do right now, I, I will go here. Uh, I'm on the regular platform, so I will uh, click on Jupyter Lab and open my notebook. This is not running the DNA Nexus job, and uh, I will mention here the main sections of this notebook. Uh, and would like to inspire you with uh, rerunning uh, this notebook for your UK BRAP uh, data. Uh, um, in the um, header part of, of this notebook, you can find how to prepare your environment. So I kind of uh, uh, followed these instructions um, and selected the um, recommended instance type. Let's say uh, we are here uh, working with... Uh, publicly available data uh, from fMRI uh, lab from, 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 from the FSL group. Uh, we are uh, downloading and un un unzipping the file uh, here. Uh, then uh, in our notebook, we would like to install and uh, import uh, packages. Uh, yes, uh, here the essential or very important part is to import FSL because we would like to apply some transformations, some functions from FSL, and we will be doing it via NiPipe interface uh, and many other mm, mm, imports. Uh, but this is the this is the main uh, this is the uh, more most important uh, part uh, of these notebooks in terms of uh, import packages. Uh, then, as we downloaded our data, we can load this data. Uh, we are working with a nifty file, uh, as it was mentioned uh, during this presentation. It's a volume data, and uh, it could be um, uh, it could be represented or stored or saved um, in uh, gzipped uh, format. So gzip here is uh, to produce a smaller file size, but uh, some of the neuroinformatics tools. Uh, can directly work with uh, gzip files, and FSL is one of them. Perfect. Uh, for each file, for each nifty file, we can get some metadata information. Uh, at this moment, uh, we are trying to print uh, MRI shape, or we can look at uh, header of the nifty, uh, which is telling us more about image dimensions, data types, and other uh, measurements. Um, details and uh, metadata information, uh, right? And then in the next part, uh, we can try to first visualize uh, MRI slices. So how we can uh, do that? Uh, we can reuse this uh, code uh, snippet, but as a result of this, uh, we will get uh, three uh, projections or three orientations uh, and uh, this is uh, showing us, this is plotting a brain, uh, including uh, a skull here. So in the next section, what, would, what we are going to apply? Actually, we would like to apply the same operation as we showed uh, via Docker image uh, and Swiss Army knife. And this is the extract brain operation, or in other words, it's uh, skull stripping. So what we can do uh, here in the notebook, so we can, uh, as we imported uh, FSL via NiPipe, uh, we can create, uh, we can create FSL bat, FSL bat uh, node, uh, which is loading uh, input data and uh, which is uh, producing some result. And then we can run the object skull strip run, uh, and this will, produ this will produce a derived uh, nifty file. So after processing this data, we will get uh, 
really the same output, uh, but now uh, we applied the brain extraction. Similarly, uh, we can apply other FSL functionali functions, uh, other FSL functionalities. Uh, one example could be uh, isotropic smooth operation. So uh, this will uh, lead to uh, smoothing operation on the image. Um, what is very um, important and what is a really nice feature is to combine, is to wrap this individual FSL operation into workflow. So uh, using NiPipe, actually, we can construct something what is called directed acyclic graph. And this is consisting of individual interfaces, as we, as we saw it. I mean, FSL, smooth FSL uh, brain extractions. These are nodes, and we can connect these interfaces as edges. So what we will do, we will first create nodes. So let's consider first node is a skull strip. Uh, actually, we are creating a node, which is doing some FSL operation, then some smoothing process. This, this is second one, second node. And then some, let's, let's add one, one more, which would do FSL apply mask operation. And we can then initiate or create a workflow uh, which has some uh, specific name, and then we will connect uh, some uh, nodes uh, to form uh, edges uh, and create a workflow. So uh, then uh, once we create this workflow, we can visualize it. So now we have good representation and good understanding uh, of uh, which steps uh, our wor workflow um, consists actually. And finally, at the end, uh, we would like to run it so we can we can run this workflow and this workflow will compute all the steps and uh, produce the results. So once once we are done with the computation, we can visualize results. And here on this uh, in this uh, plot, uh, we can see all the steps we done. We can see the input image, which was T1 uh, Nifty GZIP file. We applied smoothing. We um, um, we computed brain mask, and we then apply smooth operation. So this was really quick um, demo of uh, what you can do, uh, or which type of advanced analysis. Actually, I mean FSL free surfer and combine it uh, into uh, NiPipe workflows. You can do on the wrap. All right, so going back to the slides. And uh, I would like to kind of uh, wrap up and summarize the presentation. Uh, but before that, I would like to mention other options for working with, with imaging data on RAP. Uh, there are many options you can work with. Uh, we, covered, uh, we covered these tools um, either in uh, April or maybe today. Uh, but the options are cohort browser. You can work with Swiss Army knife, as we mentioned. Uh, there are many other options, but typically for neuroimaging, uh, this would be the NiPipe, as we showed. But also, you can try to create your workflow um, using Viddle uh, if you have um, knowledge or experience uh, resulting from your bioinformatics experience. Uh, and uh, also, you can uh, you can analyze your data uh, in uh, or using R Studio, so, and in all of these, you can do to some extent, or you can apply and train your machine learning models. So, uh, please uh, stay tuned. We are uh, preparing a session. We are planning a session which would be um, focused on, which would be devoted to uh, training machine learning models on image derived phenotypes. So um, please uh, sign up for a newsletter. Please sign up for a community, more specifically here, imaging section. You can ask your questions there, uh, not just uh, limited to neuroimaging. Uh, also, you can use, uh, you can ask about uh, OCT. Uh, but uh, as, uh, um, as kind of preview, uh, we would like to uh, cover how to work with image uh, derived phenotypes and how to, let's say, model uh, age based on brain volumes. So basically also talk, talked in detail about what uh, Fidel mentioned.
All right. So, yes, this is really the end of this part. And what I would like to mention as a last sentence is that you can always bring your own tools on the platform. And one of the potential machine learning tool uh, or other imaging processing tool could be MATLAB. So uh, we can try to uh, deploy this on the UK BRAP. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, thank you so much for just a wealth of information. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the people in the audience are, are going to have to go back and rewatch it, uh, but on slower mode instead of faster mode, uh, which is what a lot of people do with uh, recorded webinars. I mean, just, just an absolutely incredible second talk. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll give people uh, just a few seconds uh, to think of questions and uh, uh, pop them up in the chat. Uh, before we segue over and really see uh, how that works to bring another software package onto uh, onto the RAP platform uh, and use it in a flexible way, and I'm I'm pretty excited to to introduce uh, Rob and Renee uh, to do that. And uh, thanks for those who have been um, asking questions uh, in the Q and A as things get on, as well as the people behind the scenes answering those questions. And I'd like to say a big shout out and thank you to, to them. Um, Great. All right. Well, it doesn't seem like there are any burning questions uh, for Andre, but he will certainly uh, be on uh, uh, the panel discussion uh, a little bit later after uh, we hear uh, from Rob and Renee at MATLAB. So uh, I think it's it's probably time uh, that we transition over to them. So uh, Rob and Renee uh, are uh, at Matt, uh, MATLAB and or at MathWorks is if you will. Um, and uh, you're about to hear, they have a new image analysis toolkit and it's trivial uh, to put it on DNA Nexus and run it. So uh, I think you'll be excited to hear about this. Uh, if if what Andre said doesn't meet your needs or you, uh, you don't want to build uh, some of the things yourself, you have a MathWorks license as most all academic institutions do, uh, then uh, yeah, uh, you can uh, go to town. So without further ado, here's Rob. All right. Thanks, Ben. Uh, as Ben mentioned, I'm Rob Holt. A pleasure to meet everybody. I'm the manager for biological sciences at MathWorks, and I lead a lot of our efforts in the biological sciences space uh, across uh, various sectors. And I'm joined today by Renee Chin, who's our application engineer for medical devices and biopharma. Uh, so brief outline, we'll do a quick poll, talk about MATLAB and the life sciences, then talk about MATLAB for AI applications kind of generally, talk about our brand new medical image labeling and analysis tools, we'll run a demo, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So an opening poll, uh, everybody please, you know, uh, wake up, perk up a little bit. I see that we're, uh, we're in a lot of different time zones, so I hope everybody's had at least uh, a little bit of caffeine, whatever uh, amount is appropriate for this time of day. Uh, so I'd like you to please uh, answer this question. What's your familiarity with lab, MATLAB? Is it, are you a beginner? Maybe you kind of heard about it, uh, intermediate, you've kind of hacked around with it a little bit, uh, or would you say that you are an expert? Somebody who opens up the MATLAB, uh, MATLAB command prompt before you open up your email, you know, that kind of person. Uh, so the reason why we have a poll like this one is we really like to learn a little bit more about our audiences. And I want to be able to tailor uh, some of the things that I'll be talking about uh, to make sure that everybody gets an appropriate level of intensity out of the discussion. All right, I see we're still, uh, we still got a couple of answers pouring in, uh, but I'm going to move on for now. Uh, okay, mostly, uh, mostly beginners. All right, we'll, we'll keep it, we'll keep it relatively low intensity. All right, another question. What size of data do you typically analyze? Are we talking small megabytes? So uh, when we're talking about small data, that's what I'm talking about with individual spreadsheets or text files or you know, stuff that you might be able to have loaded on a floppy disk once. Uh, medium gigabytes, we're talking about big image stacks, lots of images, reams of data that get collected, uh, you know, medium data, 
to big data from uh, from wearable analytics, lifestyle stuff, population statistics, or are we talking about large? So large, we're talking about whole body images. We're talking about thousands of images, thousands of 3D images. Uh, we're talking about huge, huge uh, multimodal population statistics. All right, still got a few answers pouring in, but we'll move on. Okay, so mostly medium, a couple large. All right, we got an advanced audience going on here. All right, I think this is the last question, and thank you all for your patience so far here. Uh, how do you most often share your analysis? Are you making apps for other people? Do you put them in PowerPoints to show other people? Is it a spreadsheet? Like, are you sharing your, uh, your summaries in CSV? Are you publishing your code? Do you use notebooks, or is it something else, something we might not know about. Uh, by the way, thank you all for your patience. I really appreciate getting this level of background on the audience. Uh, and as I mentioned, this really helps us to make sure that we hit, uh, to make sure that we hit the right notes. Okay, so a lot of PowerPoint spreadsheet. All right, so that's enough for the poll. Thanks again. All right, so uh, MATLAB, it is a programming uh, language, it's a programming environment made by MathWorks. So there are millions of scientists and engineers worldwide who use MATLAB and also our other product Simulink. Uh, over 4 million users, 100,000 plus sites, and interestingly, all of the top 10 pharmaceutical and medical device companies, probably the top 20, but it kind of depends on how you slice numbers 18 and 19. Uh, recently, Gartner named us uh, as a leader for machine learning uh, for the second year in a row in 2021. So we're out here at the forefront with IBM and Google and Microsoft. Gartner also took the time to take a look at our customers. And it turns out that we're one of the companies where when people do work with us, they really like working with us. All right, so MATLAB, what is it? What can it do? Well. We've tried to make something that's one platform for an entire workflow. So MATLAB can uh, access files and write files, of course, uh, a lot of the common data types that we're all going to be working with, DICOM, NIFTY, and so on. We have tools where you can draw uh, data from a database or scrape the web. We also have tools that can read right from instruments, like inline from instruments, and even control instruments. Uh, this middle section, Explore and Analyze, that's kind of where most people are familiar with MATLAB as far as spreadsheet writing and data analytics, algorithm development, and stats. But what people don't know about is uh, MATLAB also has tools for text analytics, sequence analysis, and general modeling and simulation. So there are all kinds of tools. There are over 100 toolboxes that are part of MATLAB, and it's tough to know them all. Then. On the sharing side, MATLAB can be used to make executables, to make web apps, uh, to be able to share, uh, to be able to share methods with people, and they don't even have to install MATLAB. You can make stuff for them to use. Uh, we also have tools that are meant to make it easy to deploy and scale up to the cloud uh, without having to change, uh, without having to change the code architecture too much. And we have tools that are meant for reporting. So MATLAB can be used to write PDFs programmatically so, uh, so that you can create a pipeline and then keep running it. MATLAB can also be used to write HTML, to make PowerPoints, to write Word docs. And this is super convenient for a lot of people. So the idea is that once this pipeline is established, you can automate the whole thing in case you need to run it again. Uh, MATLAB also has a lot of strong cross-compatibility. So right out the box, MATLAB reads tabular data, signal, text, genetic, and then among image data, which I know is important for this crowd, clinical, preclinical, and microscopy. Uh, and then, of course, we have tools that interface with, the, with databases and with cloud. And we'll uh, come back to how this appears on the wrap. So why this is important is if MATLAB supports a bunch of different kinds of data, they can start to be hybridized. When it comes to deep learning, people talk a lot about taking image data, training a network, 
and then getting something like an auto segmentation or scene classification or computer aided diagnosis. But, uh, and this is really great, and MATLAB is very useful for this. But if MATLAB supports all of these different data types, then they can be hybridized for all of these different kinds of outcomes. Uh, MATLAB is also everywhere in drug discovery and development. So this is uh, a little bit more on the comm research side, but uh, just wanted to point out that in this uh, drug discovery and development process, MATLAB is well adopted, for example, at CDC for disease tracking, uh, predicting protein structures using AI, automating flow cyto cytometry toxicity measurements using deep learning, looking at the morphology of cells. Uh, one I'll come back to is brain tumor auto segmentation using deep learning, uh, reducing phase two attrition. And we have a couple of really interesting stories where in the pharmaceutical space, uh, CIPLA and uh, GSK have improved their manufacturing processes using app-based machine learning and kind of general AI. And we have a great example about predicting hospital readmission using electronic health records. Uh, MATLAB also supports the full kind of AI-driven system design workflow. So preparation, modeling, simulating, and deployment. Uh, I won't go, I won't take a deep dive into all of these individual steps, but we do support this. And we have a lot of examples about how people can and have used MATLAB for these activities. Two things I want to point out really quick about increasing productivity using apps is uh, MATLAB, we're trying to make our tools as easy to use as possible without sacrificing computational sophistication and efficiency. So one tool that I believe Renee will be talking about a little bit is the Deep Network Designer app. Uh, and this app, uh, you can open up, there's a bunch of pre-trained networks uh, pre-trained uh, deep neural networks that you can load and play around with and look at their architecture. You can also use this app to make new networks and it will automatically tell you if it is structured properly. We also have something called the Experiment Manager app, which is meant to compare multiple deep learning experiments. The point is this is very useful for parameter optimization since there are so many knobs to turn uh, when people are doing uh, when people are doing AI. So very strong recommendation on both of these tools. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, pre-built models. We have a lot of algorithms that come with the software, uh, classic algorithms, machine and, uh, and deep learning, reinforcement learning and regression. We have a lot of pre-built models that either ship with the tool or can be easily downloaded, AlexNet, GooglyNet, and so on. Uh, and we have a ton of reference examples. Uh, so here I, uh, I screen capped a couple, post estimation, segmentation, uh, segmentation of, uh, of lungs. Uh, and MATLAB also interoperates with a bunch of other frameworks. So there's new stuff coming out all the time. And we want to make sure that people can get access to some of these latest algorithms, these latest networks. So you can import TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, and Cafe right into MATLAB. And you can also go through the Onyx network to get other tools. Uh, so you can pick up something that's been trained elsewhere and bring it into MATLAB. You, know, you can also train or update something in MATLAB and then ship it to one of these other platforms as well. Uh, MATLAB also uh, is meant for use in clouds. Uh, so we do have our own cloud. Uh, people uh, use us as hosting provider. Uh, and of course, we support on-prem and public clouds, basically any cloud environment that people run into. We either have some sort of example or we have some sort of reference architecture. Uh, so we do have our own cloud and then our own tools to support it. But for hosting provider and on-prem and public clouds, we have the uh, MATLAB online server and we, we have a deep learning container on the NVIDIA NGC. And something that uh, Renee will touch on a little bit is that we have a bunch of reference architectures. We have Dockerization. We have a MATLAB Docker file. And all of these can be used to deploy MATLAB in many different places. All right. So when we're talking about medical images, I wanted to slip in a quick reference to digital pathology. One of the really neat new data types that we have is called blocked image. Blocked image is a new data type for ND images of any size. 
Uh, so this supports like out of core processing. Uh, so ND images, any size. In this case, what I'm showing is a couple of examples of what can be done using these gigapixel whole slide images. Here's a uh, H&E breast cancer, I think. So you can use this tool for segmentation, for calculating something like cell density on a patch base level. And of course, this new data type plays really well with our deep and machine learning tools. So people have used this for something like tumor heat map uh, calculation from deep learning. And right here, I'm showing uh, what is a 2D, uh, 2D RGB image, but this data type is constructed this data type is constructed to be used with images of arbitrary dimension. So this can be useful for uh, this can be useful for light sheet imaging, for example. Uh, this can be used for light sheet imaging or multispectral light sheet, or even stuff like whole body X-ray CT, whole body MRI, whole body CT spec. Uh, which has you know memory considerations uh, to, to examine. Uh, and people are already out there using this. Here's an example where University Hospital Heidelberg predicted survival from colorectal cancer. All right, but I think the most important thing for us to talk about today is this brand new medical imaging toolbox. So MATLAB has had for a long time tools that can visualize 3D volumes, that can be used for segmentation and analysis, but they've always been kind of general tools. And what we've done is we've released some new tools that are specific for medical imaging and medical image analysis, especially to support AI workflows. So we have this new tool for visualization, segmentation, registration, and labeling for 2D and 3D medical imaging. Uh, and I'll go through a, a couple of examples of what, what the software is meant to do. So our, what we're mainly talking about here is MR, CT, X-ray, ultrasound, and nuclear. We're talking about radiological imaging modalities, 2D, 3D, and then 2D time domain. And we can definitely talk about 3D time domain imaging as well. Uh, so there are a couple of keystone features of this new toolbox that I want to touch on. And one of them is a brand new medical data container object. So historically, uh, historically, MATLAB has had uh, the image matrices that are loaded as one thing, and then the image metadata, which tends to be loaded into a struct, and that data uh, contains all the spatial referencing. Now what we have is one medical image container that contains that spatial referencing data. Uh, and this isn't just for Cartesian grids either. This is for non-uniform slices, uh, slices that intersect each other, and oblique slices. So this is something that helps with a lot of the bookkeeping for more of the advanced uh, users who are out there. And it sounds like there are at least a few who are, uh, who are dealing with this sort of spatial referencing problem. The other keystone feature that we have in this new toolbox is a medical image labeler app. So this is for visualization, segmentation, and labeling medical image data. So you can see that uh, we have the three standard views uh, as well as a new, a brand new visualization kernel. Uh, so we have new visualization tools that can be updated in line to show regions as they're being labeled. This is GPU accelerated, which is really fantastic. Uh, for 3D visualization and rendering, we've made it easier than ever to change the opacity and transfer, uh, as well as the color maps. And of course, we have a couple of uh, we have a couple of uh, 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 schemes, visualization schemes that come right out of the box for linear grayscale, MR, CT, and so on. Uh, I also want to point out. Um, I also want to point out a couple of tools that we have. For example, um, I have some videos here which don't seem to be rendering. But what we have are two super cool, super new things that I wanted to highlight briefly among our suite of semi-automated labeling tools. And one of them is level tracing, where a user can click on a region and it will flood fill. Uh, so 
a user can click on a region and then manually adjust a threshold and it will flood fill that region. And in very short order, you can have something like a, uh, you can have something like a, a lung image, like a segmentation of a lung. Uh, similarly, we introduced new uh, features that are for painting by super pixels. So you can press the paint by super pixels button. It'll break the, the image down into super pixels of a size that can be determined again through a user defined threshold. And in very, very short order, in a couple of seconds, in fact, it's possible to label something like an entire 2D bone uh, in an X-ray projection. Uh, so it, and then of course, you know, not every uh, semi-automated segmentation is perfect. So uh, an advanced user can go back and correct some of these things by hand. The point is we have new tools that are very specific for advanced, fast labeling and subsequent analysis. Uh, we also have new tools that are for image registration using iterative closest point and moment-based registration. And we also have 3D volumetric deformable uh, and group-wise deformable registrations. And these are all specifically more geared toward medical imaging. And these exist on top of all the kinds of registration that already existed in MATLAB. Uh, we also have some brand new uh, pre-processing tools, for example, for ultrasound denoising and for resampling. And this exists on top of all of the old tools that were already in MATLAB for things like median filtering, range filtering, or you know Richardson Lucy deconvolution, or you name it. So we have this medical image analysis workflow from import through training when it comes to AI-based applications. And we have this brand new toolbox, the medical imaging toolbox, which sits on top of the image processing toolbox, which sits on top of MATLAB, but this also plays really nicely with all of our other products. So we have a, our deep learning tools, computer vision and parallel computing that work pretty seamlessly with these new tools. Uh, and that's not even to mention all the other stuff that MATLAB has like statistics or reporting. And people have already started combining these different uh, workflows for something like surface extraction. So taking a bone, segmenting it, making a surface, and then using that for 3D printing or for finite element method analysis. And this, we're already seeing people use this for prosthetics development, for example, or implant development. Uh, here's an example where our tools have been used for deep learning for 3D tumor segmentation, in this case from multimodal MR, but um, you can imagine that there are lots and lots of different applications for 3D UNET. Uh, we also have a brand new example where uh, brain MRI data uh, that is possibly pre-labeled has been downloaded. Uh, one can easily import and start using the SynthSeg 3D UNET and then use that for uh, brain parcellation. And then we have out of the box a dice coefficient of 0.86-ish or so. So here's an example where you can take a, an existing network, bring it into MATLAB, and start using it in pretty short order. And we have a ton of other examples on our website for display, import, label, and segmentation. Uh, so one thing to consider, one thing to keep in mind as you're starting off on a new project is that there's a huge community of development. There are a ton of people out there who are developing really great new stuff that uh, that's built on top of MATLAB. And a lot of that is hosted at our file exchange, which is a bunch of open source tools with open source licenses. Uh, and there are a ton of people who are writing stuff that gets hosted on GitHub as well. Uh, and you can also put something on GitHub and then cross list it on the file exchange so that you only have to update one location. And, um, uh, and but you're still increasing the visibility of whatever it is you're working on. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to when it comes to MATLAB, uh, the MATLAB environment, we have a lot of tools that are useful for uh, life sciences. Two that I didn't mention are SimBiology, which is for quantitative systems pharmacology and PKPD, and we also have bioinformatics tools. 
But since all of these tools exist under the same umbrella of MATLAB, it's possible to start combining these things for very specific, very new, very interesting applications. So there are a lot of advantages of using MATLAB. One is that we have a lot of domain-specific workflows, for example, now for medical imaging. We also have the ability to deploy on a lot of different locations, including for online platforms like the RAP. There's, we also have uh, a lot of interoperability. So sure, MATLAB runs on the cloud and Linux and Mac, um, but we can also bring in networks that were trained in Python. You can also call MATLAB from Python and, and Python from MATLAB. Uh, one big thing is the user community. So we have the website, we have the MathWorks file exchange, uh, and then we also have MATLAB Central, which is a message board where people post their questions. And a lot of the time, the staff will cruise that and then answer some of those questions. And the most important thing, perhaps, is the people. Right now, you're getting introduced to me and to Renee, but there are a lot of people out there who are willing to help. In fact, we have a helpline where if you call it during normal business hours and if you have an active MATLAB license, uh, you get connected to a human being in an average of about 10 seconds, and that person probably has a master's degree, and they will uh, help you with your problem. And if they can't help you immediately, they will connect you to someone who can, like me and Renee. Uh, we also have a lot of web pages that are specifically geared toward helping out in the life sciences. Uh, and uh, Renee, am I seeing your screen right now? I sure hope so. <laughs> does it look like MATLAB? Okay. Uh, it does. Uh, it does. It looks like MATLAB uh, on the platform. So uh, everybody, please switch over right. to the media. Uh, and uh, Renee, please take it. I guess to, as, as by way of brief introduction, um, I'm an application engineer at MathWorks. I currently specialize in our medical device and pharmaceutical customers. Um, and my professional background has been in medical imaging. I specialized and did my master's thesis in um, um, perfusion MRI of the brain. So that's sort of where I like to live. It's where I feel most comfortable. Um, pull me out of there and I can probably still get stuff done, but I'm happiest with images. Um, all right. So since we might be a little bit short on time, I'll just very quickly talk through how I got into MATLAB, and then we'll actually dig into the, the meat of things here. So from a page that you probably, I hope, are familiar with um, in the DNA, the DNA Nexus platform, um, basically you follow their instructions for how to get TY, TTYD started. Um, I am pulling the Docker Hub image of MATLAB um, and running it. So that is um, immediately up and running and available, um, kind of contains all of the basic toolboxes that a typical user would need for deep learning, right? Um, and so you just pull that and then hit run, and it will run um, on, on, on your, your, your server. So here is sort of what you get taken to once you've got it up and running. And my specific demo here, or I guess um, for those of you who may not have not um, be as familiar with MATLAB, hello and welcome to the MATLAB desktop. Um, for the most part, we have a pretty uh, straightforward environment, I like to think, right? We have our tool strip at the very top. It's a really good place to get started. If you don't really know what el where else to start, just kind of start clicking <laughs> on the tool strip, create a new script, open, um, load up some data, et cetera, visualize your data, or do something in the apps tab. All right. Um, MATLAB in, um, at its fundamental core is a programming environment. It's a language. Um, and so for, um, for those of you who are more familiar with MATLAB or like me, you've been using MATLAB for a very long time, um, we do a lot of programming directly into environment, right? We, we do a lot of um, prototyping directly into, into the command line. Um, but I'm going to spend as much time as I can in the apps today. Um, however, I do want to make sure that I kind of 
orient everybody to the case study that we will be looking at. So our case study today, I have a bunch of chest x-rays. This is coming off of, I think it's the pediatric pneumonia Kaggle competition. So that's where the data set is if you want to try this out yourself. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to point to that data set using the data store command. If you are working with images of any kind in MATLAB, use image data store. It's the, by far the easiest way to get access to your data. And so right off the bat, I immediately get access to my nearly 6,000 um, images of chest x-rays. They are either normal or pneumonia. Um, and I can sort of get that summary of all of that right here using this container called I, um, Image Data Store. All right. Um, just to, again, for further uh, orientation to the image, um, to, to, to the case study that we have, I'm going to pull in one such example of the image. And you notice I'm doing a couple things. First of all, I'm reading from the image data store, but I'm also going to um, cut the image down by half. That's just because the images are kind of big. Um, and if I try to display the full-size image, it can um, take some time to load. So <laughs> just chopping it um, down by 50% just so that we don't uh, sit and listen to silence first several seconds waiting for something to pop up. All right, so got a bunch of chest x-rays. They look roughly like this. Um, this one's a normal image, I believe. And we will be training a neural network today, or we will start training a neural network today. We probably won't finish. Um, but that will take us through the task of um, image classification. All right. I'm using image classification because it's one of the most basic, simplest, easiest ways to introduce um, deep learning to an audience. Um, if you're already familiar with AI and deep learning, um, this, uh, a lot of what I'm about to say should sound very familiar to you. And if not, take this as a primer. Nice uh, introduction to deep learning. All right. So I just entered um, um, into our Deep Network Designer app. All right. Um, and what I'm going to do is, for the sake of expediency, because it will take a very long time otherwise, I'm going to select one of the simplest neural networks that you could probably work with called AlexNet. This is, oh my god, 2012, I want to say? <laughs> very long time ago. Um, AlexNet came on the scene and sort of blew traditional machine learning out of the water, particularly when it came to um, the task of image classification. So one of the earliest neural networks that was published and, and um, looked at as a very serious contender in the deep learning race. Okay, so I'm going to pull in AlexNet. You can see it's a very simple series network. There's, um, it mostly consists of repeating layers of convolutional neural uh, convolutional layers and ReLU layers and pooling layers. So for the most part, it's sort of um, repetition of those several layers. And I'm going to perform a little bit of artificial neural network surgery here because the original Alex network um, was originally intended to look at images and classify them out of a thousand different classes containing things like dog breeds, car, bicycle, pedestrian, that sort of thing, right? And we aren't particularly concerned about distinguishing dogs from cats. We care about distinguishing chest x-rays between the normal and pneumonia in this case, right? So we're going to set up our own fully connected layer to output two classes, which is what we care about. Um, and then by default in my image data store, it's actually going to automatically inherit the classes. And I'll show how to do that in an alternative fashion as well. All right. So that's really quickly how you might uh, create a neural network. Obviously, you could start from scratch if you wanted. Um, I'm fairly lazy. I prefer to uh, <laughs> build off the shoulders of giants rather than start from the ground. Um, but then, of course, because I am 
um, going in and mucking around with someone's artificial brain. I want to make sure that I haven't broken anything, and so we'll go check out the Deep Network Analyzer app just to confirm that I haven't broken anything. Um, there are no detectable warnings or errors. My network should train without issue. Fantastic. Now, at this point, you could say, well, I've designed my neural network, but I want to send it off to a colleague, or I want to train it in Python. That's totally fine. You can export your neural network once you've made whatever changes you need and export it to Onyx Framework or Cafe or whatever it is you want to export it to. We are certainly happy to provide that. You can also um, take a step back and say, hey, I want to learn a little bit of MATLAB. I want to see what this code is so that I could do it myself later without the app. And you can do that um, by automatically generating the MATLAB code as well as with um, initial parameters, um, if that's something that you so choose to do. Again, I really like to work within the app itself. Um, I think it's a great way to really quickly get through things without having to spend the time learning um, the code syntax in documentation. So I'm just going to go through the steps provided by the app. All right, and so one of those things uh, is to pull in the data now that I have my neural network. Um, set up. So I'm going to specifically select um, the test folder in this case. This is not best practice, but for the sake of time, because um, it can otherwise take a very long time to get through this example, because deep learning takes time. Um, I'm going to select the test folder, and from within the test folder, which I think is a few hundred images per per class, I think that's the, the, the number of images. Um, so it's a relatively small data set for a deep learning data set, right? Um, and so I'm going to pull out a validation set randomly from this, this small set of images to, to um, try to prevent overfitting in this small data set. All right. You notice if I if I want to additionally protect against overfitting or somehow otherwise augment my data set, I can do that as well um, by adding in ref random reflections or rotation or rescaling, um, which can be very important depending on your application. So I'm not going to turn that on, but um, you could. So go ahead, import said data set. And I can see all of my images and the breakdown between normal and pneumonia for the training set and the validation set. Okay, about 400 images, a little bit more sizable. Okay. And then that's my validation set. So my validation set is a bit smaller. All right. So... Very quickly, the next step, once I have my neural network set up and now I have my data selected, the next set, it, step is to select my hyperparameters, my training parameters, right? And this is what you would be manually or utilizing the experiment manager um, to tune in order to sort of optimize accuracy in your neural network. All of these things can um, surprise, in, sometimes in surprising ways, but sometimes in expected ways, um, affect the accuracy of your eventual neural network. So things like adjusting the, the initial learning rate or mini batch size um, or the regularization value, all of these can affect that. Um, I mainly want to highlight here, I'm going to just train on a single CPU in this case, um, but, you know, if you initiate um, um, a, a server with GPU access or with multiple cores and you want to use all those hardware resources as part of your training to help expedite the training, that is available to you. You can, in fact, perform your training across multiple cores and GPUs. Um, I'm going to just go with the default values and go ahead and train. And this is where it might start to take some time. So the last time I tried to run this, I think we were copying the network and training the network for a good few hours. So I won't make you sit and stare at this for a while, although towards the end of maybe our Q&A session, if anyone's interested, I can pull this up again and we can take a look at, you know, what, how far in the training we've gotten. Um, otherwise, while this is... Um, getting started, I want to take us through um, uh, a couple other 
um, points that I think are very important, right? So what I'm showing you here is an example of taking some medical images, chest x-rays, and just getting some image classification out of it, right? Um, more often than not, I tend to see people really wanting to do things like performing semantic segmentation um, of, of various regions of interest inside of their medical images. And so that's really where we want to highlight things like our medical imaging toolbox for the labeling and then eventual passing off to, say, 3D or 2D neural networks to perform that semantic segmentation of the brain. So if you wanted to check out some of those examples like Rob highlighted, you can check out our documentation. Um, they take us through the entire process, um, and, and there are many such examples. Um, and then the other thing I want to highlight is that I think a lot of folks don't realize this about MathWorks because they see it as a tool for um, automotive engineering or aerospace engineering, but there are actually a lot of medical examples. If you want to search specifically for your imaging modality or your application, you may very well find your um, um, an example or, or a user posting of your actual application area, your actual case. Study. So um, definitely, definitely, you know, don't don't write it off um, at, in, when you're when you're trying something for yourself in in our tools. Additionally, also, I'm very happy to talk about medical stuff in MATLAB. I'm happy to talk about other things that you can do with images in MATLAB. Um, that is about 95% of my job. So uh, feel free to to reach out, ask questions in the Q&A panel. Um, we can we can definitely um, tackle some of those questions today. Okay. All right, we're still copying the network. This takes, this, this part is what takes time. I like to kick it off and then I go out to lunch usually is what I do. So I think at this point I'll probably hand it back and we can take a look at questions. Hey folks. Are we okay uh, on time? Any any questions for Rob or Renee uh, at this point before we go to sort of uh, before we pass things off to uh, Asha and then move over to the uh, uh, panel discussion? Any burning questions? Again, for those of you who are still on and have been on since the beginning, thank you uh, for, for really uh, being in this marathon of information. I mean, uh, Hopefully this uh, this amount of information will take you through until after the holidays so you can just kind of take off now and, and finish up for the rest of the year. But first, we would like you to actually try this on the RAP uh, if you are a RAP user. And so uh, please go ahead and give it a shot. Um, and uh, we will be on the community. Uh, we will be posting written instructions uh, for launching uh, MATLAB on uh, DNA Nexus. All right. Um, okay. Uh, I've been informed that uh, it is evening in the UK, and so we should uh, move on uh, as, as quickly as possible. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to bring up Asha Collins. Uh, Asha is a phenomenal leader in uh, uh, this area of uh, cloud computing with large public biobanks. And so... I will turn it over to her. She's going to talk a little bit about cost considerations before we get to the panel. Uh, thanks, Sasha. All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, very um, quickly too is is really and this came up earlier in the um, in the symposium. Someone asked about the cost. Um, this is a common question that we get quite a bit in terms of people um, really trying to understand how do they estimate the type the cost of the analysis that they're going to do. Um, and there are a number of sort of variables around this. And so basically what I'm going to share with you today too are what those variables are and the, the guidance that we provide people to help them think about how to think about the costs that might be incurred when they're doing their analysis. Um, one of the first things that we um, think about doing um, is really just the rate card. The rate card is the, the foundation for what your analysis, how your analysis will be costed out. Um, and this rate card is public. The link that's at the bottom of this slide actually uh, is exactly, shows exactly what the rate card is. If you can see the rate card, you can see that um, 
The storage rate, the egress rate, as well as the compute rates are listed here. And these rates are listed and are the same for all users. So, and it's also the same for the, any type of analysis that you're doing. These are the storage, egress, and compute rates that will be applied to your analysis. One thing I'll also say about these rates is that they are the result of a deep partnership that Amazon Web Services, AWS has with UK Biobank. Because of their deep partnership, and because AWS is um, broad of investment in UK Biobank, Rapid, as well as the overall program, these um, rates are extremely um, advantageous. If you have an AWS cloud environment in your organization or institution, these rates are likely much, much better. Um, and that's why this slide is sort of titled Advantageous Market Rates, because um, AWS is really providing these analysis um, as a part of UK Biobank's desire to really have the access to the platform be democratized and to not have it be cost limiting for anyone. Um, so they provided these quite discounted rates across the board for everyone to sort of take advantage of while doing their analysis on RAP. And sort of to that point, if you look at the actual specific rates that are here, you see that it's sort of about one pence per gigabyte for storage, around sort of four pence per gigabyte um, for egress. And then, of course, compute is going to depend on the type of instance that you use for your analysis. So whether you use spot or whether you use on demand, this will really impact um, the type of sort of compute costs that you will sort of generate. Um, and I think I saw earlier that there are some beginners um, or some early experienced people on the, the symposium well too. So um, just to be clear, so the, the difference between sort of spot and the on-demand um, rates are that um, spots are, are, spot instances are a lot more cost effective. And so if you have an opportunity where you don't necessarily need to have your instances run at a certain time, if you can have your implications sort of be interrupted, start and stop, you can potentially use spot for your um, analysis and it'll be a lot more cost um, competitive or advantageous for you. And then of course, for things that you need to run at a certain time, et cetera, you can um, leverage the on-demand rates there. So this is really the, the, the structure, so the basis of which the analysis, the computer analysis, the storage costs, as well as the egress costs are sort of generated uh, based on your analysis. But your analysis is actually the biggest variable in terms of actually generating accurate cost estimates um, for what you might be charged at the end of the day. And this is where it gets a lot hairier. Um, and because of that, um, actually in community.dnanexus.com, we actually have a few posts that really try to help guide users in terms of how they should think about the different variables within their analysis that might drive costs up or perhaps sort of contain it. Like I was saying, we're sort of with the spot and on-demand compute instances. And so one, a few of the things I'll just mention here, uh, but perhaps we'll put the actual link in the, the chat too so that everybody can get to it. But if, if you actually go to community.dnanexus.com and simply insert cost in the search panel, you'll see a number of uh, posts come up that really talk to this. But as I was saying, if you think about your analysis, thinking about the complexity of the analysis that you're doing, the software tool that you're using, um, whether you're using parallel computing or not, RAM requirements, storage size, and then the size of your inputs. These are all going to be ex um, really important variables to think about in terms of how much cost will be sort of generated with your analysis. And because there are so many different variables, it's quite difficult for us to say like, this is how much something will cost. However, definitely sort of take a look in the community because there are also uh, at least sort of one or two users that have actually um, shared their exact analysis and how much it costs them. And so leveraging and understanding how example analysis and their cost um, were for other users, I think can be really useful for other users to be able to start getting a feel for the cost, especially if you are extremely new to a platform or new to UK Biobank. This is a really great sort of starting point. 
The other thing that we also suggest too is just to run sort of a sample of your data and sorry, sample of your analysis. And if it's the, the same um, sort of analysis, but at a greater scale, that is probably actually one of the most accurate ways to actually get a sense of the fees that will be charged. So overall, so that's how we think about so the cost and the cost generation sort of on the platform. So first and foremost, we have to the rate card, really generous rates that are provided to us and to users by AWS and UK Biobank. They're public, they are the same for absolutely everyone who's on the platform and they're published. So you can look at them at any time and use them if you wanted to estimate your analysis, estimate the cost of your analysis. And then for sort of more nuance around that and more sort of insights around the variables there, I would definitely suggest for you to check out community.dnanexus.com and some of the posts there where users talk about, ask questions and answer questions about cost. So I'll pause there. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, any burning questions for Asha about cost? All right. Um, I, I did see that too. Oh, okay. So I just, if there, if there are no other questions about cost. I do want to just, again, sort of emphasize again the AWS credits program. I know we talked about this at the beginning of the, um, the symposium, but again, I know there's been a lot of information. Um, this is really key too, because if you're an um, early career researcher, or if you're a researcher in a lower middle income country, the credits program actually allows for you to get a starter grant for a thousand dollars. And then once you have, um, and again, if you go to, if you use this QR code, you can go and you can see exactly what uh, early career researcher definition is exactly. And then you can, and actually it's listed here too. And then you can also see the countries that are listed as low and middle income countries. If you are a researcher in any of those categories, you qualify and are doing qualified research on RAP, you qualify to be a part and to um, be allocated these credits. And so you simply just have to apply and write UK Biobank. And there are two different types of credits that can be awarded to users. One is sort of a getting started grant, and that's $1,000. And then, and this is really just that if, if you're, whether you've actually done research or not, if you first time applying to the program, you can be awarded this $1,000 credits program. If you run through that credits program, then there's the grant enhancements program too, where you can apply for an amount that is really sort of just dependent on what you think that you'll actually need. And so this can be tens of thousands of dollars, $10,000, et cetera. And so that's another way to sort of think about, especially if you're a researcher in those categories, if you have a collaborator who's a researcher in those categories, to think about how you can potentially, again, be cost effective in how you're thinking about um, leveraging your resources to complete your analysis. Definitely look at and, and leverage the, the platform credits program because, again, this is a program that AWS is funding um, sort of half a million to a million dollars. There's a lot of credits because we're really looking to help advance as much science from the platform as possible and really want to make sure that money is not a limiting factor to people being able to do great science on the platform.